transcript client meeting. So as you have heard, the recording is on now. Uh, so welcome everybody and thanks for joining this uh, weekly uh, seminar. So my name is Pierre Valla and I will share this seminar today uh, together with Vivi Peterson and Rebecca Harris. And um, so I recall you that we still have some seminars coming in the next weeks and uh, next week is uh, Laura Quick, Quick. So you can already find the, the links to register if you're interested for next week's seminar. And uh, today we have uh, the pleasure to have uh, Jan Anderson from Aarhus University. So Jana has done a, a PhD at Aarhus University and she graduated in uh, 2017, if I'm not wrong. Then she crossed the uh, Atlantic Ocean and she went to Purdue for a postdoc. And then just before the uh, COVID lockdown in 2020, she came back homeland in uh, Denmark where she is now uh, a postdoc at Aarhus University. And today she will talk um, on the first about uh, the landscape evolution, cosmogenic nuclides, I think, and a lot of uh, ice sheet or glacial processes. So Yana, please uh, welcome and um, the stage is yours. Thank you, Pierre. So um, my talk today will focus on some recent attempts to use cosmogenic nuclides to quantify erosion in high latitude passive margin settings that have been intermittently covered by Pleistocene ice sheets. And um, I've planned three parts of this talk. So first I'll review a bit of the past discussion on the efficiency of erosion beneath high latitude ice sheets. Secondly, I will present some case studies from Greenland and Scandinavia and discuss what we have learned about ice sheet erosion at high latitude passive margins from measuring cosmogenic nuclides in surface rock layers. And finally, I'll discuss a study on periglacial hill slope erosion from cosmogenic nuclides in depth profiles in Scandinavia. So um, whether erosion beneath continental high latitude ice sheets should be measured in tens or hundreds of meters or more has been a source of speculation and debate for a long time. And although not the first time this discussion appears, it, uh, the debate was perhaps most clearly expressed in a series of papers written in the 1970s and 80s by William White and David Sugden. So um, in the defense of deep erosion by continental ice sheets, William White, among a number of other observations, note the peculiarity that exposures of non-orogenic Precambrian rock are often concentric with the extent of former glaciations. And this is the case both in the Pleistocene, as you can see from a figure from his paper here, where you see the exposure of Precambrian rock and the extent of uh, the Laurentide and Fenoscandian or Eurasian ice sheet. Um, but uh, apparently it's also the case for the late Paleozoic ice sheets, as can be seen if you compare the extent of Precambrian rock in the darker colors here, with the extent of uh, ice in the late Paleozoic ice ages. Um, so the erosion estimate tied to White's observations and speculations is not very clearly specified in his paper. That's a more of a conceptual nature, but uh, an estimate can be inferred from this cross-sectional figure from his paper. Um, and to be on the order of sort of hundreds to up to a kilometer of, of erosion, uh, with the bulk of this happening in the central parts of the Laurentide ice sheet in this case, um, and diminishing radially outwards. However, a few years later, David Sugden sort of made a comment a paper on this, where he summarized a number of counter arguments against the idea of deep glacial erosion by ice sheets. And just uh, some of these are listed here. So firstly, uh, Sugden summarizes studies that argue that the Hudson Bay Depression, which was the region of deepest erosion in White's model, is in fact a pre-Pleistocene feature based on the structure of Paleozoic sediments along its southern rim. And secondly, he highlights that the provenance of the oldest till deposit from the Laurentide Ice Sheet in Illinois indicate that the exposure of Precambrian basement was approximately at the same location as today 
and therefore isn't a result of ice sheet erosion in the quaternary. Finally, he notes that many of the landscapes within the footprint of the Northern Hemisphere ice sheet do not appear to have a glacial geomorphic signature. So based on his observation, Sutton estimates the total quaternary erosion to be only on the order of a few tens of meters. And the difference in their estimates of total quaternary erosion is therefore quite substantial. Um, the idea of efficient erosion beneath continental ice sheets was recently picked up and revived in a paper by Keller and others who suggested that the great unconformity, which is this globally widespread hiety on top of Precambrian basement rocks, was formed by globally efficient glacial erosion during the Neoproterozoic, with a suggested average magnitude of erosion of three to five kilometers. So this paper is mainly based on oxygen and hafnium isotope excursions in circons, which the authors suggest indicate unusually high amounts of crustal erosion and sediment subduction during this time. But the authors also lean on the observations and arguments by White to support their conclusion and include this figure that again show the concentricity of the Laurentide ice sheets with exposures of Precambrian bedrock that are here outlined in red. So at the center of this debate lies different perceptions of uh, the erosive potential of ice sheets outside of topographically confined regions. So on one hand, White sees the ice sheets as efficient aerial erosion agents that tend to flatten landscape by particularly attacking protruding hills. And on the other hand, Sugden focuses on the selective incisive power of ice that carves out these classical glacial troughs and fjords, and he terms this selective linear erosion. So the selective linear erosion view is particularly inspired by the ge geomorphology of the high elevation ice marginal regions, where large glacial troughs intersect low relief interflufs, which are sometimes um, covered by these uh, regolith mantles of local lithology or weathering phenomena such as deep weathering pits or protruding tours or clay assemblages that are attributed to a warmer pre-glacial climate and therefore indicates a limited glacial erosion. And this type of bimodal landscape with apparently efficient erosion in glacial troughs and fjords, but apparently very limited glacial erosion on interflutes is characteristic for large parts of Western Fanascandia Scotland, the exposed rim around Greenland and northeastern Canada, uh, all in sites that sort of fringes the Pleistocene ice sheets. However, extensive, apparently non glacial landscapes also occur in low elevation, low relief areas at high latitudes. And these landscapes are characterized by pervasive regolith cover and fluvial drainage patterns, sometimes coinciding with ice divide zones, such as in northern Scandinavia or Lapland. So there are a number of different ways to try and uh, figure out how much ice sheet erosion has taken place. And one way is to try and reconstruct uh, ice sheet erosion volumes um, by reconstructing a pre-glacial landscape uh, and inter interpolating between non-glacial landforms. However, the setbacks of this method are that the landforms are often pretty localized in some areas and also that the potential quaternary development or erosion of these non-glacial landscape elements is often more or less unknown. Another way to estimate quaternary erosion rates would be to use estimates of present day sediment export. For example, as this uh, example from Greenland ice sheet. Uh, however, extrapolation of these data is challenged by the probability that ice sheets may be most erosive in deglaciation phases such as the present, and the, that the rates are therefore not very representative for the long term. So finally, a number of studies have made source to sink analysis by reconstructing quaternary offshore sediment packages and put them back to their most likely source areas after accounting for porosity and biogenic components. And these analyses are sometimes sophisticated further by dividing the deposited sediments into what could have been sourced from glacial valleys and fjords, 
and preglacial sediment packages on the shelves, such as in this recent paper by Vivi Pillerson. So this slide uh, shows a compilation of various estimates of erosion in high latitude erosive, or sorry, passive margin settings since the late Cenozoic ice sheet inception, based mainly on these source to sink reconstructions, although the Scottish estimate here also has an element of preglacial landform reconstruction. Uh, you should note that the more recent estimate from the southern uh, Fanuscandia in contrast to the other studies shows only the erosion in excess of what can be filled in to glacial fjords and troughs. And for the Pillarsen study, also what can fit onto the shelf. So to a first order, these estimates suggest erosion rates within the footprint of Northern Hemisphere ice sheets on the order of minimum around 10 to 20 meters per million years, and at maximum around 100 to 200 meters per million years since ice sheet inception. And this is comparable to a recent estimate of around 15 meters per million years from Antarctica since ice sheet inception at 34 million years ago. So this range of estimates fall in between the estimates uh, provided by White and Sugden, with more than a total quaternary average of a few tens of meters, but on the other hand, probably also less than a kilometer. The main challenge with these source to sink estimates are that the source regions of the sediments are often hard to define with certainty. And also that these bulk estimates tell little about how the sediment was distributed on shore. Furthermore, the temporal evolution of ice sheet erosion remains poorly constrained uh, in these uh, sediment packages with only a scarce number of cores sort of protruding the offshore uh, sequences. And then a lot of interpolation along uh, over large distances by seismic data. So in the remainder of this talk, I'll therefore discuss how we can use cosmogenic nuclide measurements within the source regions to constrain erosion rates under these former ice sheets. So <clears throat> cosmogenic nuclides uh, form as a cascade of high energy particles from space impact Earth's surface. And because these particles mostly penetrate a few meters into the solid earth, the cosmogenic nuclear inventories can be used as a chronometer of change at the surface. Um, in non-glacial catchments, uh, cosmogenic nuclides are routinely used to infer basin averaged erosion rates from cosmogenic nuclide inventories of well-mixed sediment in streams. However, for glacial catchments, most of the necess necessary assumption for basin averaging fails. So in glaciated regions, apparent exposure ages of surface samples can instead be calculated using the site calibrated production rates and by uh, accounting for decay and erosion. So I'll, if the ice during the last glacial period was sufficiently erosive to remove cosmogenic nuclides produced during the last ice-free period, the apparent age calculated from the cosmogenic nuclide inventories represent the time on last deglaciation. And this is why cosmogenic nuclides are commonly used to infer the timing of the last deglaciation. But often erosion was less than a few meters. And in these cases, the calculated apparent ages will exceed the de deglaciation age. And we can instead learn something about the longer term erosion history from what we term the inherited sigma. Uh, and this is the cosmogenic nuclides that are accumulated prior to the last glaciation. So if we have a set of bedrock samples that are covered per periodically by a non-erosive ice sheet, the ratio of two uh, cosmogenic nuclides with different half-lives will change over time, such as you can see in this lower left corner in this animation um, for beryllium 10 and aluminum 26, which are commonly used uh, nuclides. Um, However, uh, episodic erosion events of the surface samples can create similar end concentrations and end ratios. And uh, for this reason, we use inversion modeling techniques to constrain the combined ice cover and surface erosion histories that best fit the data. And all the inversion results that I will show today are based on the assumption that the global Bentic Delta 18 curve reflects the ice sheet volume although we include the threshold or a threshold to this curve 
to define the ice cover locally at our sites as a free parameter in the model. So uh, I will show two different examples of how we have used cosmogenic nuclides to assess erosion histories of glacially dissected passive margins that were repeatedly covered by ice sheets in the quaternary. Before I go on to compare these data with the existing bedrock data from around the North Atlantic. So this figure shows the distribution of samples uh, collected in a transect along Sonefjorn in Southern Norway, where we sampled bedrock on low relief summit flats on each side of the fjord in a transect from near the uh, Western coast and inland. So the colors of the circles represent their apparent uh, beryllium 10 exposure age. And since the deglaciation of this area occurred very rapidly at around 11 to 12,000 years, apparent bedrock ages exceeding this age indicate that erosion was not sufficient to remove all nuclides accumulated during prior exposure. So the figure on the right here shows the calculated erosion rates based on inverse modeling of beryllium 10 and aluminum 26 um, in all of these samples. And this is plotted as a function of elevation. And the gray bars in the background represent the hypsometry for the sonifero catchment. Um, and from the shape of this hypsometric, hypsometric distribution, you can see the prominence of these low relief summits or plateaus from where we collect our sam samples. So there's a lot of scatter in the erosion rates with elevation. Uh, but overall, the rates are smallest at highest elevation uh, on the order of a few meters per million years and increase, to, increase towards low elevations to more than around 10 to 20 meters per million years. However, it's important to note here that uh, there's an inherent trade-off between erosion rate and the time that this erosion rate represents, with higher erosion rates uh, really only representing the last glacial period, whereas the lowest rates represent up to the last million years. So for the higher uh, erosion rates, we are unable to constrain the maximum rate, and this is indicated by these stipple lines towards the right. So the overall trend that we see in this data set uh, follows roughly the gradient in the geomorphology of the sites along Sonefjorn, with more apparent glacial scouring on the lower elevation sites towards the west coast and uh, a block field cover on the highest uh, surface towards the east. Uh, several glacially scoured sites, however, as you can see in this uh, diagram here, where the, the block field site is uh, outlined with black. Um, so several of the glacially scoured sites has comparable erosion rates to the block field sites outlined here. So um, that the erosion rates are not always directly linked to geomorphology is also something that became apparent um, when compiling and grouping all existing data from Scandinavia by geomorphology in four classes. Here, uh, glacial troughs, uh, airily scoured surfaces, block fields, and tours. And as you can see, each of these classes have a range of different nuclide um, inheritance from none and up to more than 50,000 years, uh, indicating that they also have very different erosion histories. And this means that it's not straightforward to guess the erosion rate of a point in the landscape just based on the uh, geomorphology alone. So the second example of ice sheet erosion on a glacial trough dissected margin stems from Southern Greenland. And here we collected a data set quite similar to the one from Sonefjord with a transect of samples from the coast and inland uh, to the present day ice margin on the highest uh, low relief summits. Um, and these uh, elevations also increase inland. Um, And also the degree of weathering uh, again follows this. So there's more apparent indications of glacial scouring towards the coast and at low elevations and less so at higher elevation. So um, in the figure to the right here, all our samples are um, arranged by elevation from highest to lowest. And if we start by looking at the lowest panel here, that shows the erosion rate since 1 million years. 
um, we find that the model erosion rates generally increase at lower elevations. Um, although some sites in trough position at high elevation also show high erosion rates. And really only a handful of samples from this landscape at the highest elevations have very low erosion rates, such as the samples in red here. So the middle panel shows the integration time scale over which the erosion rates are valid. And you can see the inherent trade-off where erosion rates less than a few meters per million years are constrained over millions of years, whereas the higher erosion rates uh, are really only valid for the last glacial pe period and furthermore have unconstrained maximum values. So in other words, where the ice sheet is efficiently eroding, the cosmogenic nuclides only have a short memory of erosion. So if we now zoom out again to look at these results in context of um, the nearly 1500 bedrock samples that were collected from areas formerly covered by ice around the North Atlantic margins, we can see from the distribution of the samples in this figure where uh, the colors represent the apparent beryllium 10 H um, that all regions here contain samples that exceed the last glacial period. And if we extract the ages within a number of different regions encircled in red on the map now, we can plot their apparent beryllium 10 ages as a function of elevation for each region, as is shown here. So these panels also include the hypsometry of each region in gray bars, while the blue line indicate the average present day snow line altitude for the regions uh, as an indicator of the present day climate. And the samples are colored by their elevation in relation to the local snow line altitude, according to the scale on the left here. So uh, before interpreting this data set, I should come with a cautionary note here, because these samples are compiled from literature. They were originally collected for a number of different purposes. And although I know that a relatively large proportion of the samples was collected with the aim of assessing the polythermal and polyerosional nature of ice sheets, others were collected, for example, to constrain the timing of the last deglaciation. And uh, this creates a potential spatial bias um, and means that we should be careful when drawing conclusions from details in the distributions. However, with this in mind, a few uh, first order observations can be made. So firstly, it appears that many regions display, display an increase in apparent exposure aids with increasing elevations, such as we also so, saw in Southern Greenland and Scandinavia. Um, and since the ice sheets were probably thick enough to inundate most of these sites, this trend probably mostly reflects nuclide inheritance stemming from decreasing erosive power at higher elevation, where the ice is thinner and perhaps cold based, rather than representing shorter periods of ice cover, although that may also to some extent play a role. Secondly, it seems that the apparent ages become progressively older and show more inheritance and thus lower erosion rates in the colder regions, such as the, uh, in Baffin Island, Western Greenland and Svalbard, um, where the climate is approximated by the present day snow line. So when we compare the distribution of high ages uh, corresponding to low erosion rates, probably with the hypsometries, we see that for most regions, the bulk of the high age low erosion samples were collected within the tail end of the hypsometric distribution. And this means that they only represent relatively small areas of insignificant erosion of these landscapes. However, in colder regions, um, a much larger part of the landscape um, were covered in cold based non erosive ice during recent glacial periods as judged from these distributions. So most of these uh, um, regions display at least a few high apparent low erosion uh, ages at low elevation, such as these uh, ones in Southern Scandinavia. So um, this shows that glacial erosion, almost, although it's often efficiently eroding these landscape at low elevation, is not, it's not always the case. <clears throat> 
And finally, it's also worth noting that most of these samples were collected from these uh, selective linear erosion landscapes. So these glacial trough dissected highlands at the margins of the former ice sheets. However, the group of samples collected from the Finoscandian uh, ice sheet interior shown in the diagram on the right here, uh, generally show low erosion rates at low elevation. And this is probably a result of the position of many of these samples under the ice divide where basal ice movement was minimal. All right, so as the la last part of this section of the talk, I would like to reflect on how these patterns and rates of subglacial erosion relate to the long-term denudation under high latitude ice sheets. So you may remember from the introduction to this talk that there was a general disagreement about whether er ice erodes mostly aerially or linearly. And this is something that was explored in a modeling paper by David Eholm, where this figure is from. So the three panels on the left here shows how an initial fluvial landscape subjected to glacial or ice sheet erosion uh, gradually develops two large glacial troughs. And the three panels on the right here uh, show the basal sliding of the ice uh, gradually changing in sync with the landscape change. And if we can use this sliding as a proxy for subglacial erosion, this shows how the erosion pattern goes from uniform in the beginning and then gradually develops a more selective linear erosion pattern um, with the bulk of the erosion taking place in the troughs and with ice on the interflues becoming gradually stagnant and cold based, which is shown in this white colors here. So this has the implication that erosion rates measured on plateaus today would have been higher in the past during the early quaternary cycles. But unfortunately, we are not really able to test this idea using cosmogenic nuclides because uh, cosmogenic nuclides only accumulate at quite shallow depths, a few meters. Um, it would therefore be useful to have a method that could measure erosion on a scale of tens to hundreds of meters on quaternary time scales. But this is something that, I, to my knowledge, we don't, we're not currently able to. Okay. So now I'll turn to the uh, last uh, block of the talk here. And um, here we'll focus in on an, a, a landscape in Southern Norway that's affected by periglacial hill slope processes. And where the term periglacial means areas or processes involving repeated freezing and thawing. Uh, and this short video here uh, zooms into uh, this periglacially affected area in Southern Norway within the Rheinheimen National Park. Uh, so that you can get a better idea of what these block field mantle hill slopes look like. Uh, you should note that this region was well inside the boundaries of the last Scandinavian ice sheet and has probably been covered by ice sheets multiple times in the quaternary. So the landscape that you see here is characterized by a cover of surface blocks and fines that is largely derived from the underlying bedrock. The freeze thaw of ice and water within the surface layers lead to a sorting of the materials after grain size with meter wide stripes of blocks separated by vegetation covered fine grained areas, as you can see here. And these stripes gradually morph into sorted circles at lower slope inclinations towards the summit of the mountain. You should also note that these landscapes are really uh, quite uh, gentle relief. It's these broad, flat uh, units, almost plateau-like, but yet with some topographic relief on them. All right. So in Rheinheimen, we also undertook a sampling campaign and collected more than 70 samples uh, from exposed bedrock within the landscape and from block field boulders and in five cases, we also excavated pits into the blocky surface cover to collect samples in depth profiles, although we only reached about one to one and a half meters depth. So all these samples were analyzed for their cosmogenic beryllium 10 and aluminum 26 content. And uh, this elevation transect of apparent beryllium 10 ages is comparable to what we saw before 
with little relative nuclide inheritance at low elevation and increasing amounts at higher elevation. Uh, our results also surprisingly shows that ages uh, from most of our samples, our bedrock samples, the orange dots here, um, overlap the deglaciation, which took place around the Younger Dryas chronosome, which is the gray bar here. Uh, and this indicates that these sites eroded at least one to two meters during the last glacial period. Um, this erosion is most common below around 1500 meters, but uh, some erosion takes place up to around uh, 50 meters below the highest summits in the area. And this shows that the last ice sheet was at least sporadically quite efficiently erosive up until near summit levels in this landscape. And uh, on the right here, you can see two examples of uh, samples collected at fairly high elevation that nonetheless had very young ages. So one additional thing we can see from this data set is that most of the bedrock samples that exceed the last deglaciation actually cluster around an age of uh, 30,000 years. Again, we're mostly looking at the orange uh, bedrock samples here. So this clustering might indicate that the penultimate ice cover was sufficiently eroding some sites in our study area that were not subsequently eroded by the last glacial ice. And if we assume a high degree of ice cover as shown in the top panel on the figure on the right here, the distribution of measured ages would fit with efficient erosion during the penultimate global uh, glaciation if the erosivity of the ice was patchy, but efficient during past glacial periods. Um, whereas if we assume a lower degree of ice cover, the penultimate erosive event would have to be more recent to fit this pattern of uh, uh, clustering of the eight sample ages. So if we now focus in on the hill slope processes taking place in the block fields covering the highest summits in Rheinheimen, as you saw in the video before, block fields are often organized into areas of blocky and fine grain materials, which is known as patterned ground, with sorted cirques and stripes depending on slope. However, it's worth noting that although the term block field sort of focuses on the content of coarse clasts and blocks, a lot of the block field mantle actually consists of fine grained, silty, and sandy material, which is where the sorting and movement of material really originates from because this is where ice segregation and the formation of ice lenses and frost heave can lead to expansion of the sediment package. Whereas the coarser class or the blocks probably mostly ride along passively on this fine sediment and then accumulate at the rims of sorted circles and stripes by deposition following sort of a movement up through the fine sediment matrix, uh, which is also indicated in this sketch. So in Rheinheimen, we excavated five pits into the block field uh, and collected samples for cosmogenic nuclide dating. Uh, and before uh, turning to the dating, we assessed the geochemistry and mineralogy of the pit materials. Uh, and from this, we found that the fine matrix within the block field had a composition similar to the local host rock in four out of five pits. And for these five pits, we can therefore exclude a substantial input of glacially derived or windblown sediments for these materials. So it's locally derived. Further, we can see that the block fields contain very small amounts of clay, uh, which is dominated by prim primary, primary minerals. And we can also see that silt constitutes around a quarter to half of the fine materials. Um, and these observations fit with weathering patterns in periglacial environments that generally show only slight chemical weathering of surface materials. So we inverse model the beryllium 10 and aluminum 26 inven six inventories to derive erosion rates, uh, while also allowing for mixing of the sediment following this periglacial process. Um, so the gray contours in this figure so it's the model depth profiles compared with our measured values. And the resulting erosion rates range from less than 10 to a few tens of meters uh, per million year. And the lowest erosion rates in the two central plots here um, 
comes from pit profiles near the summit of these broad flat uh, yeah, mountains. And uh, from geomorphological mapping of these landscapes, we infer that only really quite narrow regions around the highest low relief summits seem to be largely undisturbed by glacial erosion in the last glacial period. And even here, erosion rates established from our two highest pit profiles show that these surfaces erode at rates of at least three to nine meters per million years. This indicates that periglacial hill slope processes, perhaps with a minor component of glacial scarring, must have been quite significant in the quaternary. Especially when we see these rates in light of the periodic halts in periglacial activity when these uh, processes are shut down by uh, ice sheet cover. So although these rates are not tremendously high and the loose materials we find at the surface today uh, definitely have survived beneath cold-based ice during at least one glaciation, we find that they were not preserved at the surface since the pre-Pleistocene. So when we fit polynomial curves to transects of the landscape topography as seen in the figure on the right here, it seems that the slowly eroding central parts of the periglacial active summit regions in Rheinheimen display a roughly parabolic form. And uh, the, a smooth convex parabolic shape is expected for landscapes dominated by diffusive hill slope processes, independent of the process. Because the slopes adjust to increasing sediment discharge away from ridges and summit, a steady state is approached. And this was something that was argued by uh, Gilbert already in the 1870s, but has also been picked up later by other authors and has also been shown in model experiments implementing periglacial processes in a landscape evolution framework, as you can see here. So the parabolic form uh, of the mountains or the very summits in Rheinheimen probably suggests that um, these regions were dominantly controlled by hill slope processes on long time scales, and that in the long run, glacial erosion has probably been a minor component of surface change. Although we see evidence of glacial erosion almost to these this level of these regions or summits today. Okay, so to summarize this section, we find that we can use cosmogenic nuclide chronometry to assess the near surface residence time of block failed materials. And we see that um, or we find for Einheim in a high degree of glacial scouring, uh, almost to the level of the summits today. And um, the highest and slowest eroding parts of the block fields indicate erosion rates of down to around three to nine meters per million years. And this is presumably mostly a result of periglacial hill slope processes. Um, and these rates are low enough for block fields to survive recent glaciations, but not for them to survive the entire quaternary. So to summarize uh, overall this talk, um, we can use uh, cosmogenic nuclides within the footprint areas of former high latitude ice sheets. Um, and this has taught us that glacial erosional efficiency is often patchy and diminishing at higher elevations. And also that uh, the local geomorphology is not always a good indicator of uh, glacial erosion. Uh, we can also see that large parts of the more southerly situated landscapes around the North Atlantic were relatively efficiently eroded by the late quaternary ice sheets, but that colder and more northerly landscapes have a higher proportion of inherited nuclides, indicating less efficient erosion, at least in the later part of the um, quaternary. And uh, whenever ice sheet erosion during the last glacial period exceeded a few meters, we are unfortunately unable to constrain the maximum rates with the cosmogenic nuclide method. And this really prevents us from assessing erosion rates on longer time scales and at greater depths where erosion is more efficient. And since landscape evolution modeling indicates that erosion rates have decelerated on, over time on these low relief summit flats in the quaternary, uh, it would really be great to have a, a method that could test this idea. <clears throat>
because right now we, we don't know for sure. So these are my references for this talk and I'm happy to have a discussion. Okay, thanks a lot, Jana. Very nice talk, very interesting results. Uh, I think you have seen that the chat is now open for, for discussion, for your questions. So if you would like to type your questions directly in the chat, or you can type an X if you would like to uh, orally ask your question uh, to Jana. So I think there's a first question by uh, Jesse under one. Uh, then high and a multi OSL thermochronology can do tens of to hundreds of meters of erosion rates over quaternary time scales, I think. And uh, suggesting that you can look at the work of Georgina King at Uni Lausanne. So there's no question, it's just a comment or mm -hmm. a suggestion right. concerning your last, uh, last uh, sentence. So, is there any question or remark? If there is not, I have one, which is a bit off topic of what you presented, but I'm a bit curious. You've talked a lot about periglacial or glacial processes in your talk over long term, but I mean, when you see this high relief uh, or not, not so high relief, but what is occurring in terms of post-glacial fluvial processes in, in these areas, especially the fjords of Norway, do you have, is there any quantification of what is happening in terms of fluvial? Erosion during interglacials? Uh, not that I know of, but it might exist. Yeah. Um, I haven't looked into the sort of post glacial erosion history so much, unfortunately. I think there is a question by Gerald Rab, so I can try to uh, unmute Gerald if I find. I think I'm unmuted. Do you yes. hear me? James? Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, just a question regarding the snow shielding. How do you deal with snow shielding factors for your TTN calculations? And do they differ from the Scandinavian to the Greenlandic areas? Um, usually, we kind of discount it because we know so little about it in the long term. And then we approximate the effect to be on the order of, yeah, maybe 10% affecting our results. What, what um, is your basis then for this approximation? Just uh, calculating what a, you know, few meter thick ice or snow field over um, half the year for a period of time, would, how would that would influence the surface production rates. But we don't do a more sophisticated treatment than that. Okay, thank you. There's another question by Peter Nieno. Um, Hi, Jane. Thanks for your talk. That was fantastic. Um, I just wondered, do you think that you need your, basically the bed to be a hard bedded um, ice bed interface to get your your estimated erosion rates or can these rates occur irrespective of whether you've got a till um, underlying the, the glacier and could and could the differences between a basically an, a hard bed and a, and a soft till bed explain some of the variability um, yeah I'm not sure I mean it uh, if you have till deposits, it would uh, reduce the cosmogenic nuclide. Uh, I mean, in interglacial periods that is now gone, it would reduce the cosmogenic nuclides too. But like the places we have sampled generally don't have a large cover of glacial till. I'm not sure if, if that really answers your question or not. I guess I really wonder just in, in terms of for a lot of the work in with what's going on in Greenland at the moment, there are different discussions about whether the ice sheet's got a lot of till underneath it or, or not. Mm. If it were with different people arguing different things and presumably that might impact therefore erosion rates. I just wonder whether it would be, whether the Cosmo might, might help sort of um, 
tell us whether in fact, you know, we haven't really got that much till underneath the, the ice sheet or vice versa. Uh, I see. I'm, I'm not really familiar with that discussion so much. So I don't know if I can give you a good answer to that. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. I mean, I don't know either <laughs> at all. Okay, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. Um, okay, I can't uh, put my video on, but uh, that's okay. Um, thanks very much for the nice talk, especially about this nice uh, pattern ground. Yes. Um, and I have a question to those because I have always wondered is when you dig into those, do you assume that the process of this like material sorting is still ongoing or actually is maybe slowing down or actually stopping at some point because when everything is sorted uh, that is there then the process is not actually ongoing anymore right yeah but the pattern still remains and yeah. so I don't know like in this area where you've been um I went to to the Jontenheim and I had the feeling that there were some patterns which were inactive and probably did not have any ice in them anymore um, but they were still very much fine and sorted. And so what you get is actually the process you you would date, I would say, was then something that happened much, much I'd say in the past. And it's not necessarily happening so much, but you might have what you might have happened in the fine particle part is just some creotubation where you just move the material internally, but you don't sort anymore. Did you see any big difference between like the fine material and the more blocky material? Well, it, it's something we didn't check for in this study here, but I was actually on field work uh, last year, I think, where we tried to measure cosmogenics in both the fine grained and the blocky parts to try and answer exactly that question. I mean, I think there's no doubt that some of these block fields are sort of fossilized, right? If you yeah. look at the present day distribution of uh, permafrost in, uh, and periglacial activity in Norway, you know, the, um, the climate is warming and the zones of where this process is really efficient is probably quite restricted uh, in the Scandinavian mountains today. Um, but with the, uh, the data that we have from another side uh, showed that the, the youngest components of the whole system were the blocks. So from the, uh, it's a slightly more coastal side in Norway, but there it seemed like, um, you know, I had this idea that, that maybe the blocks would sort of uh, be moved up and arranged in these rings and then would sort of uh, armor the surface so that not much more uh, movement could happen. But in fact, the, the totally opposite was true there. Like it, it really seemed like the, the blocks is what has come most recently to the surface. And uh, the whole region seemed to be quite dynamic. And that's even at lower elevation than Reinheim in a place that I expect where that, you know, efficient periglacial activity lies further back in the, uh, in the past. Okay. Have you, like, is this been published? No, we just got the results this spring. Okay. Yeah. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you uh, very much. <laughs> you. Okay, so we have a question also from Trevor Faulkner. Go back up. He says, thanks for an interesting talk. The mountains in central Scandinavia between 65 and 68 degrees north are lower than those in north and south. Has there been concentrated ice flow in this area that's caused more erosion? Yeah, that's an interesting question and something we've considered, but there actually is sort of a paucity of cosmogenic data in that region. So we can't really answer that, but it might be something that's worth looking into in the future. But on the other hand, since it is at lower elevation, uh, our results from elsewhere would indicate that we would anyways, uh, see a higher erosion signal in that landscape. I think that the offshore record is, uh, shows quite substantial uh, deposition of 
material in the quaternary there. So that would sort of su support the idea that, that uh, it's been efficiently glacially eroded. Okay, uh, we have another question from the chat from Bernard Halley. Thank you very much for the very impressive talk covering such a diversity of material. The cartoon from Goodfellow et al. combined with your own sediment sampling at a series of depths brought, me, uh, brought to mind a periglacial process question. Might your cosmogenic data inform you about the vertical advection of soil and debris below the surface and exhumation? Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think we can definitely see from the shape of these profiles here that um, there must have been some periglacial activity and sorting going on fairly recently, um, because otherwise we would expect a more exponential profile of the cosmogenic nuclides if this was uh, several thousands of years ago. But instead, we see this almost uh, constant uh, er concentrations at depth for most of our profiles. Um, but because of the long time scales of beryllium and aluminum, it's uh, probably not the best nuclides to look at uh, the timing of this process because they integrate such a long time period. Um, so, I mean, we, we don't really know from these data if it's something that has been going on from the deglaciation at uh, 11, 12,000 years ago and until today, or if it happens, you know, more uh, episodically or throughout uh, that time period. Um, and I, I've seen studies that suggest that, you know, these sorting processes can happen very quickly uh, if there are favorable conditions. So by no means it needs to be the whole period in order to create these uh, cosmogenic profiles, I would say. There's, there's, uh, there are more comments on this period. There's a comment by Brian Wally. I think uh, sorted tone cycles, etc., can be epizetically formed, as in Scotland. In northern Norway, we found them emerging from under a receding cold plateau glacier. On a, a question by Anne um, asking about the vanishing or disintegration at uh, time scales, they need to form or persist or vanish for this. So I don't know if you want to comment on these observations on the question, Jana? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me that they, uh, you know, can be preserved under cold based ice, which I think that's what we also see here in Weinheim. Um, but I think that like what we show here is that the process in itself is often enough to lower these hill slopes um, by several meters per million years. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Is there any other question or remarks? Please go ahead, we still have time. On the many questions for, for Jana. I, I do have one uh, about the compilation you did for the Atlantic um, Atlantic part with all the, the glacial erosion rates. So you talk about southern uh, parts where the um, uh, which are more erosive uh, of the of the southern uh, of the Atlantic Ocean, so the Fennoscandia uh, compared to Greenland. Do you observe any in your compilation uh, west est? A contrast so between Scandinavia or by Finn Island or etc. in your compilation, do you think there is a, a east west gradient um, uh, in the Russian rates that you've measured? I mean, I think there is a relation with climate, and climate has been slightly warmer at uh, higher latitudes uh, in Scandinavia than uh, on the other side of the North Atlantic. Um, so I think that is why we see that northern Scandinavia is generally has a higher degree of erosion than, um, let's say, Western Greenland or 
uh, Baffin Island, which is at the same latitude. Um, so in that way, you can talk of an east-west gradient, I think. But it's more of a climate signal, I would, would be my guess. There's another question by Trevor Faulkner uh, asking, what is your summary for maximum quaternary erosion in glacial valleys? Oh, all right, so I mean, that's exactly what we cannot capture with this cosmogenic nuclide method. We can only give, give minimum estimates and then speculate on how they transfer over the entire quaternary. Um, so this is, yeah, where it would be good to have some other methods in play, I think to really answer that question. Okay, well, well just as a follow-up on this question, oh, there's one more question by Bernard Allais. Uh, could you update us on whether there is a consensus on the amount of quaternary erosion for Western Norway, on what it is? Uh, yeah, I mean, the estimates are starting to converge at least. So uh, the last uh, two papers by uh, Vivi Pedersen and uh, Philip Steer uh, both arrive at an estimate of around uh, 100, 250 or 200 meters over the quaternary. But this is erosion that's taken place uh, outside of valleys and fjords. So it's something that needs to be put on top of these uh, plateau surfaces somewhere. It does not all have to be in Rheinheim, for instance, where we can see that it has been much lower. But yeah, overall, yeah, I would say that's that's the best estimate at the moment. But it's spatially very variable, as we can see from the cosmogenics. Okay. Any other question or remark? Okay, not from the audience, not from the moderators, no. Okay, well, if no question, no further question, thank you again very much, Jana, for the, for the very nice talk on all the material that you presented. Um, just to let the audience know that uh, we will put this, um, this talk online soon, so you will have another chance to look at it again and digest all the data that have been presented. And, um, if there are no more remark or question, we thank you again and we will reconvene next week for the next uh, next seminar. Thanks again, Yana. Thank have you. a good day or good night, everybody.